our modern culture is very much fixated on the nature of identity. There are many teachings, studies, and explanations for what the self is. This knowledge is as diverse as there are nations and cultures and traditions. The purpose of our tradition is to explore the universality of consensus, where these diverse perspectives align, to look for commonalities and to understand that which is practical. We use many techniques within the Gnostic tradition to better access our own understandings of reality, particularly the reality of our own psychology. What people tend to get wrong in our modern era is the belief that knowledge of the intellect is precisely knowledge of our true identity. This is evident by the fact that <clears throat> really, despite the amount of knowledge available and information on the internet, people are profoundly confused. We can use the state of suffering of humanity as a barometer for understanding how connected we really are with truth, with the divine, with the spiritual. And so rather than leave our understanding merely in the mind to accumulate some type of information that may sound interesting or novel, something in the intellect, we choose to follow a very different path in this tradition. We like to verify the truths and realities that have been discussed within religion, within psychology, within mysticism. No matter the tradition, we take what is useful and discard what is useless. Primarily, we use our own experience to verify what is real and what is not and the same truths to the nature of our own identity. And so the purpose of this course is precisely to understand tools and techniques by which we deepen our relationship with the divine self. One such technique that we're going to explore is a self-observation. If you're familiar with the writings of Gurdjieff, he is a esoteric writer who taught primarily in Russia um, a long time ago. This technique is very practical and profound for achieving insight into what in us creates friction within our families, within our relationships, within our communities, and obstacles between ourselves and direct access to these higher spiritual mysteries that many traditions teach. So all religions basically teach that we need to awaken to the truth. But sadly, the techniques are often missing from those teachings. So we're going to explain in a hopefully more secular way what this is, self-observation, and how to apply it to our life. So primarily what we'll do is that we're going to identify, experience, and actualize the constituents of perception. What makes perception what it is in a practical sense in our daily life? We'll also differentiate between passive and active perception, what it means to receive the impressions of life in a passive way, but also how do we actively perceive life and what that entails primarily because it's important to understand qualities of consciousness, what they are, so that we can not only identify them, but distinguish between different types of perception, because the human being is a very complex entity, and our psyche is very complex. So we have to understand different types of perceptions in us. We also are going to learn how to utilize, expand, and strengthen the powers of consciousness. So what are techniques that train that part of ourselves which can experience reality, divinity, 
the truth. What are the abilities of consciousness? And also more importantly, how can we initiate, sustain, and master continuity of conscious being? So not merely just to initiate a type of practice like this, but also how to sustain it in life. How do we make it a continual process whereby we're acquiring new knowledge about ourselves for the betterment of ourselves and our community? This brings us to the first point, the very nature of self-discovery. If we approach a teaching like this, it's because we've understood, at least initially, that we do not have the full picture about who we are. And so we look for religions and teachings to show us ourselves, to explain who we are and how we can change the quality of our life. We do not have full knowledge of ourselves in the most profound sense. Now, this is evident when we explore a particular problem. Perhaps in our career, we have a challenge that we don't know how to resolve. And yet, as we enter a state of engagement with life, perhaps we're trying to avoid the problem or trying to solve it thinking and rationalizing what to do. In a moment of silence of mind, when we're not thinking, suddenly the insight enters into us. It comes from somewhere. We don't know. But it's a shocking experience that provides a shock to our consciousness. We suddenly realize the solution to a problem. We didn't have to deliberate or think about it. It merely arrived when the proper cause and conditions were present. And when we stopped struggling in the mud of fear and anxiety and anticipation, we let it happen. And in a sense, this insight emerges from the void, but it gives us a new inspiration and a joy. That type of insight and inspiration, which really is a part of us, but seemingly comes from nowhere, demonstrates to us that there is wisdom within the psyche that is not accessible to our contemporary senses, to our current ways of behaving in our modern life. Now, primarily what we want with this technique of self-observation, as we're going to explain, is to cultivate that, that type of aha moment, where we realize something profoundly about ourselves that we never saw before. Perhaps it's a type of emotion or element in our own psyche, which is secretly causing many problems for ourselves. So what we want is to cultivate that. The purpose of self-discovery is primarily to enlighten our full potential to access deeper parts of us that are not accessible to our material senses. Instead, we're going to activate a sense that is much more profound, but is in us in a dormant state. It does not have full development or activity yet. If you look in the image in the bottom right here, we have an island above the surface of water. And we very well know from Freudian studies Freudian psychology, that there is a subconscious. This is now a fact which is taken at face value. The purpose of self-observation, of insight, is precisely to explore the depths. We do so because we want to understand our own complexes, our own defects, our own tendencies that tend to work in the depths of our psyche without us even knowing it. And what we want is to explore our full potential. So that by going into the depths, we learn to master ourselves. So that is the purpose of self-observation, to explore the depths of who we are, primarily to extract wisdom. However, in life, as in really any type of institution, there are proper and improper tools of self-knowledge. As we were mentioning earlier, 
there are many forms of knowledge and studies that teach us about who we are. And there is value and credence to different perspectives and different types of instructions about psychology. But unfortunately, in our modern era, we lack practical tools for really knowing who we are. There are parts of us that can only be explored by the right tools. If we use our intellect to explore ourselves, it'll be very shallow. It's a very useful tool in life, the mind with its rationalizations and ability to categorize information, to store knowledge and use it for one's career or job. It in truth is the most superficial aspect of who we are. It's merely a machine that can store knowledge or intel, uh, data that can be recalled or used in certain instances in life. People in our modern world tend to use the intellect at the expense of everything else, especially in North America, the West. And this is a huge problem because we think that by getting an education, a career, studying in university, that somehow with our intellectual knowledge, we know who we are. Perhaps going back to our earlier lecture, we talked about personality, especially our name, our culture, our language, our race, our religion, our tastes, our habits, the mask we wear, the interface we use to navigate social circumstances in life. Personality is needed to subsist in this world, but it is not the full definition of who we are. And as we explain about the essence, the soul, the consciousness, that real part of us that can explore who we are in, a, in its full totality is not active, is asleep. The consciousness, the spiritual part of us is not active. The intellect in us tends to be most predominant in our current lifestyles. And so we want to emphasize that when we are exploring ourselves, we have to understand which tools we are using. In the same way that a astronomer would study the stars with a telescope and a scientist or a biologist with a microscope, they we have to use this the right tools. And the intellect, while it has utility in life, is not the full means of exploring our full identity. It would be absurd for an astro astronomer to use a microscope to study the stars or a biologist to use a telescope to study microbes. It's the wrong apparatus. But unfortunately in the West, we think the intellect is the way to know ourselves. It's a very superficial layer, but we're going to explore what self-observation is because as a technique, it trains that part of us which can really know divinity, the essence, the soul, the consciousness. This is a tool for the consciousness, not the personality, not the self, the ego, the mind. We'll explain this. So in life, we tend to operate in very mechanical ways. So our consciousness, our essence, our soul, which is like a seed, is in a dormant state. It's not predominant or active in life. And this is evident by studying our lifestyle. In our current times with cell phones or smartphones, better said, technology, people drive at the wheel of their car, unaware of their surroundings absorbed by this device, as you see in the center image here. Our attention tends to be dispersed and absorbed within superficial things. Our attention, our consciousness is not active in its most full and profound sense. If you don't believe me, examine people who get into car accidents. They're driving and they don't pay attention because they're on their phone or they're thinking of someone else or daydreaming about what they need to do. And like 
the cogs of a wheel of machinery, as you see in this image on the top left, we tend to operate in a autopilot type of attitude, going through the motions of life, but not fully present, not being here, not being now. Our consciousness is not alert. It's not perceptive of what is really going on around us, but more importantly, what is going on inside of us. This is evidenced by the fact that we tend to react to situations in very specific ways. We have our habits, our behaviors, our tendencies. In life, we have situations that tend to provoke us in negative ways, seemingly without our control. And in a sense, while we have awareness at some level that this is harmful for us or that our ways of reacting are negative, we still do it. And this is evidence for us that we don't really have full mastery of ourselves. So why do we react in certain ways? And more importantly, why are we unaware of ourselves? Why do we lack a full grasp of what propels us in the moment? What in us is inattentive? And more importantly, why are we inattentive? This is something that only you can answer for yourself by observing the fact, by looking within, studying the mechanisms of your mind, of your emotional states, of your habits, your instincts, your desires. We are a machine. Not merely as a human body, but psychologically, we are very mechanical. So we have the euphemism or the statement that someone could push our buttons, right? So the reason why we study self-observation is so that we learn not to be machines, not to be mechanical in life, but to know how to respond with intelligence and wisdom. So the way that we do it is by awakening the consciousness that could operate this human machine in the same way that the soul or a person can drive a car. The soul needs to be driving the psyche. We know basically that we may know we are seated in a chair listening to this talk. We could be at work, on our computer, and know that we are there. However, this is a very passive form of understanding. It's not very deep. And in fact, knowledge is a passive state. It doesn't require much effort. In fact, in most, in most cases, it requires none. We know we're in a certain place. We have some knowledge of it. And we go about our day. What is different about self-observation is the activity of consciousness. So while we may be passively seated here in a chair, are we observing the fact? Are we watching? Are we looking? Or are we thinking of something else and just letting memories and associative thinking come to us in a hazy cloud where we don't have much lucidity of perception of our environment? This is the distinction that we seek to emphasize with self-observation as a technique. It's not knowledge of the intellect. It's not passive. It's active. It's a form of perception that involves looking, not with our physical sight merely, but with our psychological senses. And this is something that we need to explore and to verify for ourselves. The way that we do so is through the powers of consciousness. There are three aspects of consciousness that need to be studied in order to understand self-observation, to practice it, to initiate it, to sustain it and to master it. They are awareness, attention, and mindfulness. Let's explain them. Awareness is a broad spatial perception. In the same way that you bring a candle into a room and the light diffuses in your environment, it dispels the shadows. It expands outward in its circumference to your home or your environment, the same way awareness is a spatial phenomenon. It is light in which you perceive your surroundings. You see the detail, you see the walls, or in this case of an image of a woman carrying a candle 
looking within a vaulted ceiling or ancient chamber is studying the details of the stone with a look of surprise and novelty. This is the type of perception we need to understand self-observation in its initial sense. So in the beginning, we need to expand our awareness to look outward, actually observe what is surrounding us and to look with, without labeling or marring that experience with thought. This is not an intellectual exercise. It's a perceptive one. It's spatial in that you, you try to see the depth, the color, the hues, the details, the images, or perhaps the paintings of your home. Or if you're walking out in nature, you look at the forests, the trees and the leaves rustling with the wind. You want to see all of it, take it in with great detail. And to feel that yearning and humble aspiration, that joy of seeing something new for the first time. It's a crisp, detailed, and alert state. Unfortunately in us, we don't tend to see our environment. We lack psychological clarity of ourselves, but also the space we inhabit. We have to examine, really, like in these two images, a beautiful forest with intense detail and an image of a silhouette woman standing in a forest, but clouded. You know, the saying, you can't see the forest for the trees? Well, that tends to characterize our psychological state. We have to ask ourselves, what are the qualities of awareness? What are they? It involves detail. It involves really that shock of an aha moment like watching a rain fall on a cobblestone street in a european city or seeing a sunset rise with glory and indescribable detail and beauty that cannot be imitated and that's the key it's authentic it's novel it's original you've never seen this before the same thing can apply to your room we have to be able to look and see as if we've never seen our environment before. Because oftentimes we just have a memory and we interact with our intellectual projections of our home without seeing what's actually there. And this explains why there are, in many cases, people get into accidents even in their own home. So these are the qualities of awareness. We also need to clarify and expand awareness. We want to deepen that sense of that beauty of wherever we're at so that we don't live in a haze. So this is a, known as the spatial sense. The consciousness has the ability to look outward and to absorb information of everything around it. But it has to be intentional. And that's the key. We have to will it and not merely just passively go about our business. So as an exercise of awareness, one thing you can do is to walk in the forest. If you're lucky, you know, take a, if you have access to some forest trails, go out into nature. And when you're walking in your environment on the forest trails or wherever place of beauty you can find, examine the sounds, listen to the rivulets of water cascading in the open forest. Or what sights do you see? What do you smell? like the bark of the trees or the dampness of a recent rainfall? What can you taste in your mouth? You know, obviously, if you're eating food, you want to be conscious of what you eat. But also, you can taste the air of a beautiful place and touch. What does your environment feel like as you walk? Whether it's a cobblestone path, street pavement, and you want to take in all of this, expand your consciousness outward, look at everything with intensity. Obviously, this is a conscious exercise. Doesn't mean, you know, we're doing this with our thoughts because thought is not the point. Your mind will start to wander and try to think of other things. But rather than force your mind to be silent or to gag it violently, 
you merely direct your attention, attention gently outward again to your environment. See outward, what is there? As you see here with this image of the human machine, we have different centers of our psychology that we're going to explain in more detail today. But the first I talked about is the intellectual center. It's where we experience thought. This is our human machine. And this human machine is not only physical, but also psychological. So when you're working with this awareness exercise, you're engaging really your, really your mind in a sense, not by thinking, but by silence stillness. You're walking in the woods. You're engaging your motor center. You're not trying to engage with so much the senses of your body, but inwardly, but you're looking outward. And what emotions do you feel when you walk in this beautiful place? What impulses do you sense and feel? And this is something to think about. Obviously, the first step of awareness is observing outward. But we'll also talk about attention, which is more specific. Attention is a focused, specific perception. In the same way that you direct a, direct a flashlight to look at one thing in the dark, that is attention. So awareness was a broad spatial perception. Attention is focused and directed at one thing at the exclusion of everything else. Attention is profoundly significant. And if you've studied any school of meditation, or religion, they often teach about concentration exercises where you direct your attention on one thing at the exclusion of everything else. This is a very fundamental skill to have, and which unfortunately is, is very much lacking in our modern era, especially in schools. Kids who don't pay attention. Um, attention is important. We know that it's the source of extracting new information or learning new things. In the same way that you could learn by paying attention in a superficial sense, psychological attention directed inwardly at oneself is what opens light within the darkness. We have to emphasize that there are different types and qualities and directions that attention can take. So one fundamental question we can ask ourselves in life is that when we're walking down the street in some busy city, what draws our attention and why? Perhaps we hear a car honking violently as the car speeds past a red light and we sense that object coming at us, we draw our attention to the danger. I mean, that's one very basic example. But on a deeper level, not only is, is attention important for staying alive as you're walking down the street, it's also essential in a spiritual sense to understanding where the dangers lie within our psychology. And there are different ways that our attention gets drawn to things, primarily. Our attention could be drawn by anger, or by lust, or by fear, or by pride. We talked about the ego previously. Our different defects, desires, habits, egos, selves tend to direct their attention towards the screen of our life in order to extract or better said to feed on the sensations or impressions of life. Anger is fed by wanting to harm out of frustrated desire for something or fear looks outwardly to that car screeching in the distance coming at us, blowing a red light. So our attention is drawn in that egotistical sense. But what we have to understand is that our attention can be something very intentional, controlled, and pure, rather than driven by our own habits and instincts. And this is evident by the distinction between passive and active attention. We all know we could, or we know perhaps kids or people who can sit in front of a television screen for three hours, or actually better said, now with the advent of Netflix and all sorts of online digital platforms and shows, people can binge watch six seasons of a television show straight and perfectly absorb all the plot, storyline, characters, events, conflicts, themes, music, etc. with great detail. 
People can pay attention to that very easily. But what people don't distinguish is that this is a form of passive attention. It doesn't require any effort. So like a child, as you see in this image in the center, is looking at a, you know, some UFO movie, science fiction. People can become perfectly absorbed in front of a television screen and receiving that knowledge and information with their mind active. But their consciousness, their soul, their essence is asleep. Those images on the television screen enter the mind. And unfortunately, because the consciousness is not there, our attention is not transforming it. What happens is that that information or data, those impressions enter the psyche and are not digested. We'll talk about that you know, in more detail later on, but we don't tend to observe the fact that our mind is very active and we just passively take things in, absorbed within a film. Active attention is much more distinct and is precisely the skill we seek to master with self-observation. Passive attention does not lead to change. Active attention does. Why is it that someone could sit in front of a movie for hours but, and yet can't focus on reading a book? It's a different form. It's a different skill. It's a different form of attention. A basic exercise to know the difference is to look at a candle, observe it, watch it. And as you're watching the flame in all its nuance and, and transformations and movement, look at the details of the fire, the scent, or examine or smell the candle itself. See how the light diffuses in the space of your home or altar, whatever it may be. And look at how your mind tries to wander. As you're exercising active attention, there are parts of the mind that don't want to pay attention. And this is something that we need to see distinctly in ourselves. This is the beginning of self-observation. It also shows us that the quality of our attention is very uh, diversified. That we see that passive attention is just merely taking things in without discrimination or understanding, while active attention is directed and willful. This is the fundamental skill of self-observation. This shows us what the quality of our own mind is. Now, in order to do this, we need energy. So the consciousness, the essence that can observe our own psychological contents to see the depths of who we are with active perception needs energy. We need fuel. Light cannot exist in a sense without fire. And fire cannot burn without oil, without force. Our consciousness is a form of energy and a form of attention. And every time we direct our attention at one thing, we are expending energy. So this is why in our studies, in the Gnostic tradition especially, we place great emphasis on the nature of conserving our energy, not merely intellectual or emotional, but also physically psychologically, creatively, everything. We conserve our energy so that we have a reservoir of force by which to empower our perception. The reason why people struggle to pay attention in our modern world or to actively look with active attention is because people are depleted. We are empty in our tank our mind, our heart, and our bodies tend to be very depleted because we have a lifestyle that is contrary to spiritual injunctions from diverse religious traditions. We tend to waste you know, our energies in many things and negative things. So the beginning of self-observation is, you know, we learn to save energy. And we'll talk about all the aspects of this in more detail later on, but we need energy to direct our attention because as Salman Vior, the founder of the modern Gnostic tradition stated, Wherever we direct attention, we spend creative energy. So if we have no energy, we cannot explore ourselves. We cannot see who we are. And we need energy to sustain our attention in life. In the same way that you can't work at a job without sufficient energy or with a good diet, the same way with the consciousness. We need to feed it with good food, good fuel. We have to provide the proper nourishment environment for our soul to develop. And this is why we practice self-observation, to train it 
to give it the necessary practice that it needs to awaken. One exercise of attention is to, building on the previous exercise, instead of becoming aware of everything at once, sight, sound, scent, taste, and touch, instead examine one aspect of your senses at a time. So if you're walking in the forest, just pay attention to the sounds for 10 minutes and then move to sight. Pay attention for 10 minutes to your visuals. To be even more creative, take 10 minutes to smell your environment. And if you're eating, take 10 minutes to observe what you are tasting. Be very conscious and deliberate about what you're chewing and how you're eating. Because how conscious you are when you eat determines how much energy you really ingest and transform. And also touch. If you're touching uh, the trees and the environment, you're walking and touching the pool of water in the forest, pay attention to your touch. What does the ground feel like under your feet? How does your circulation feel as your heart is pumping blood through your body? Are you really aware of your breathing? Pay attention to that. Focus on that exclusively and singularly at the expense of everything else. Just take time to focus on one of your senses at a time. That's one practice. Now, self-observation is going to build off of this because in the same way that you can direct attention to any of your senses, you also can direct your attention to your thoughts, even to your sensations of your body, your movement, your emotions, your instincts, and even your sexual drives. We'll build on that soon. But mindfulness, which is a term that people sadly toss around today with a lot of casualness, but without much understanding really signifies continuity of perception. So people often mistake awareness with mindfulness. Like if you're mindful, you're, you're really um, just aware of your body or your breath. This is one aspect, but really mindfulness in its most technical sense refers to continuity of perception. It refers to the continual vigilant state of watchfulness. So if you're observing your environment or observing yourself in the moment, you maintain that throughout your whole day. This is mindfulness. It's like a wheel. It continuously spins. Or we try to spin it continuously because it, obviously in the beginning, it's very hard to do. It's a new skill. But it is continuity of perception. Some questions we can ask ourselves as we're observing our environment or observing our own selves. How long can we remain aware? If you're walking in the woods, how long can you observe your environment without drifting off? Or if you're paying attention to one thing, how long can you sustain your attention? How long can you direct it for and hold it? Like concentrating on a candle without your mind wandering at something else. And also, if you're watching your own mind, your emotions, your feelings, your thoughts, your body, do you ever forget to do that? So obviously, in the beginning, we forget all the time because this is something that was never taught to us in schools. And so self-observation in the moment, directed inward attention can be prolonged where as you're walking in the woods or you're looking at a candle, you're observing not only your thoughts and feelings, but also the desires and impulses of our own ego that emerge within the screen of our attention. So in a sense, self-observation now really is when you're directing your attention into your mind, your heart, and your body, your psychology. And what are you seeing emerge? You're watching yourself like you're a director watching a, an actor in a movie. And so as you're observing yourself, how long can you maintain that state? How long can you remember to do it? Where you have a sense of separation of, I am my essence, my soul, looking within these centers and exploring our own, my own intellect, my thoughts, my egos, my selves that emerge in the moment. Can we remember to do that? That's mindfulness. If you're doing it continually, that's continuity perception. That's what we want. It's like sustaining a musical note on a scale or going up in a musical scale, like a bunch of notes, like seven notes, and uh, reaching a new octave where it's a metaphor for as you're playing the, in a sense, music of your own consciousness, you're 
observing and engaged with the beauty of life outside, but also exploring what is inside, we can learn to create more harmony within. So with self-observation, we talked about these two things, awareness and attention. And mindfulness is how we maintain that watchful state throughout our entire day. So I talked about the human machine, our five centers. Sometimes we call them three brains because not only do we have an intellectual brain where we think in our cranium, but also we have an emotional brain, which in a sense is a form of intelligence. We also have a motor instinctive sexual brain, a motor center related to our spinal medulla. So these have physical correspondence, but more importantly than that, these are psychological. These are forms of intelligences. We refer to them as brains because in the in a more spiritual sense, because a brain esoterically refers to a modus operandi of diverse physiological and psychological functions. It's not merely related to the body. It's also related to how our mind, our soul, our consciousness, our personality, our ego works. When we are observing ourselves, we need to know what's around us. We also need to know what's inside of us. Simultaneously, we have to observe what's going on in the world, but also pay attention to our reactions. And this is where self-observation begins. We need a division of attention. And the reason why we divide our attention in the same way that you fire an arrow from a bow, you retract the bow backwards towards yourself as you aim the arrow outward. We do this because psychologically, there has a, is a form of tension involved when you're aware of your situation, but also studying carefully your psychology. So the reason why we do this is to discover our own egos. And this is the key. So previously we talked about in know your true self, personality, ego, and essence. We explained the personality. We've explained the ego. And the essence is the one who is observing, looking outward, but also looking within to secretly discover what defects or egos are active in these five centers. Now, without fully comprehending the powers of consciousness, how awareness and attention and mindfulness work, we can't see ourselves for who we are. And we cannot extract the data we need to study each of these de uh, defects so that when we study them and understand them, we can eliminate them. This is known as the key of soul. You're dividing your attention. Subject, object, location. This key of soul is an acronym. It's also a word that means sun because it's a way that metaphorically we give light to our psyche. Subject is our own selves, our five centers, our three brains, our own defects which emerge. We have to observe all of that. Object, our external environment, the things around us, what surrounds us. Who are we with? What do we see? Awareness and attention. You're dividing your attention between the two. You need to understand both. And then L, location. Where are you? Are you at home? Are you in a city? Are you walking down the street? In the same way that light magnifies you with a mirror, in the same way with subject, object, location, the key of soul, we train our consciousness to perceive and to directly understand everything, our relationship to our environment. You cannot explore your reactions to life if, you don't, if you're not aware of what's around you or what's going on inside of you. So you need both faculties active and developed. This is a form of training. So we need to train ourselves with this new sense because if you've tried this or if you do try this, you will see that it's very difficult in the beginning. It's a new type of seeing way of seeing the world, seeing ourselves. And in the same way that you see in the bottom right image here of a woman looking at a mirror, she is seeing the invisible. That man standing behind her shoulder is the ego. It could be her pride, her anger, her lust, her fear, her defects. You can't see them with your physical senses, but you can sense your mental states, your emotional states, your sexual, instinctual, and... Uh, motive states with your psychological senses. It's a new way of seeing. You reflect the mirror within and expand it outward. And so there are great benefits to this because 
by expanding and contracting your attention, your perception, you understand what makes you tick and what makes your human machine malfunction so that you can change it. You know, this is how you discover yourself is these are the tools. So one exercise of mindfulness, and this is obviously more intensive, is you're observing your environment through all your senses. And then you're also dividing your attention to your intellectual, motor, emotional, instinctual, and sexual states. What defects are emerging in you in relation to circumstances in life? Obviously, this is, takes a lot more skill, but it's something that's very fundamental that we have to learn. That's why we start initially with observing a candle or doing an awareness walk, paying attention to only one sense at a time, directing your attention only to your thoughts or to your movement or to your emotions so that you can learn all the minutiae of skills uh, that really make up this entire sense. These are different exercises to train your psychological muscles. And in the same way that you don't go to the gym and only train your right bicep, you work with all these exercises to train the whole body so that you become a holistic being, an integral being. The same thing with these techniques. So mindfulness is maintaining self-observation of yourself, being aware of your environment at all times. It's a powerful skill that we can learn so that we can gain more knowledge about who we are and why we suffer. But there are also obstacles to self-observation. Sometimes people can engage this practice, but do it in a very mechanical way. And this is unfortunately a great mistake among many Gnostic students who've been in this teaching for some time. And anyone who's studied for this, this uh, path for a number of years experiences this problem. Or by observing oneself and observing their environment, one gets habitual. And this is the key problem that has to be addressed. One can observe one's environment mechanically, or one can observe oneself mechanically. It means to not really see what is new. I mean, you're looking at your environment, you're paying attention outwardly, or you think you are observing yourself but you're not really gaining any inspiration or novelty. You're not really feeling inspiration or joy and discovery of yourself. So going back to the initial image earlier of a light bulb above a man's head, a silhouetted figure, we have to feel joy when we explore ourselves. When you discover a defect in your three brains or your five centers, and you really understand it, you feel a great joy because a discovered defect will be a dead defect. You've caught something. You've caught the thief in action. And now you can resort to meditation and other practices to further explore that aggregate, that fault, that different part of ourselves, which is creating problems, that ego, so that it can die. And you can free the soul that is trapped in it. But unfortunately, we tend to get and many people get very lazy. You know, we think we're observing, but we're not. And this is evident by the fact that we're not, if we're not changing with time, we're not discovering ourselves. It means we're not doing it well. It has to be something novel and new. We're seeing life in a new way all the time. But obviously, it, it takes a lot of momentum to, first off, force to begin it, but also momentum to keep it going. So some questions are going to become, can there ever be too much self-observation? And as we were talking about mechanical self-observation, the answer is yes. Meaning if we're mechanical with it, meaning we're just going through the motions of it, we're not going to see the benefits. And in fact, some people believe that self-observation is straining the mind. And this is wrong. Now, what we want to think about with um, our human machine is that we have a substantial or predetermined sum of spiritual capital or money in a sense, or spiritual values, energetic forces deposited within our three brains. So in the same way that a car engine can only work if it's got fuel, in the same way our intellect, our emotions, and our motor instinctive sexual brains have a certain capital of energy or forces, or like it's like a bank and has a certain amount of money in it. And every time you act using those centers, those brains, you expend money spiritual capital. And if you use too much energy in one center over the others, 
you exhaust it and go bankrupt. And this is what results in illnesses such as uh, in the mind or emotions or the body because people abuse their energies too much in one particular center more than the others. So in a sense, mechanical self-observation can lead to that where it's like you thinking that one is observing one is really just intellectual or emotional, preponderantly emotional or too instinctive. And this can break down in our human machine. So we want to take care of ourselves. We obviously need proper energy, energy uh, nourishment and energy to sustain ourselves. But the way that we do it is by balancing our lifestyle. So the way that we help solve observation be more effective is that we balance our three brains, right? In the same way that, you know, you exercise all parts of yourself at the gym, you also want to take care of everything about you. If, there are, if you're too intellectual, take some time to listen to some good music, like classical composers, like Beethoven, Mozart, Wagner, Chopin, Liszt. Or if you're too physical, too instinctive, take time to read good good literature, spiritual literature, good books, scriptures, especially. And likewise, if you're too emotional, maybe take the time to go swimming, take a walk, go out into nature. And that way you get out of your habits, you make good habits, you balance yourself. And in that way, your self-observation can be more natural and relaxed. It's not like you're trying to force your three brains to work without balancing your centers, right? So there's that component to it too. In synthesis, can we observe our true self? We talked about ego, essence, and personality previously. Today, we talked about fundamental skills of activating the essence so that we can perceive our true divine nature. And that we can also direct that attention and will towards understanding our egos and helping to make our personality passive. Most of us have a personality, our name, our culture, our interface in life, our customs, our behaviors outwardly and our own egos too active. We want to make them passive. So that the soul, which can perceive like the galaxy, the divine within, must be awakened, directed, and purposeful. The way that you can learn this is by studying and meditating deeply on the book, Treaties of Revolutionary Psychology by Samael and Vior, the founder of our tradition. At this point in time, I invite you to ask questions. Feel free to write them in the chat and I'll read them off. We have a question. Where would you recommend someone start that has just started looking into the concept of self-sabotage? Observe yourself. We sabotage our best intent all the time observe your own ego which defects in your mind heart and body propel you to do things that you later regret or even regret in the moment you have to catch it when you observe a ego emerge in you that you know is wrong you have a choice and you can respond to the situation with intuition and you know compassion or love or whatever virtue is needed you'll know that in your heart in the moment. You can't get there and transform the impression of that circumstance if you're not observing yourself. So that's the first step. Observe yourself. Get data about what ego in you is causing your problem. And later, you know, if you in the moment need to step aside from the situation or if you have to respond, follow your intuition, not your mind, your intuition, your heart. And that's how you can comprehend the situation better. Transform it. Transform that impression that situation. See it for what it is. But you can't do it if you're not watching. Later on, you go home, you meditate, comprehend and retrospect the defect, the ego that caused that problem so that you can go deep into it so that your inner divinity can annihilate it. There's a lecture we gave in a previous course called Gnostic Meditation. The lecture is called Retrospection Meditation, where we go into great detail about that. And also what we're talking about today here builds up to that course. So we'll provide that for you.
We have a question. Can you please re-explain Key of Soul? I've had trouble with it in the past. Could you give an example? Yes. You're walking down the street in a city. You're observing yourself. Subject. Observe your three brains. Your thoughts, your feelings, and your impulses. Object. What's going on around you? What do you see in your vicinity? The people, the people walking their pets, the streets, the street lamps, the lights, whatever it may be. And location, where in the city are you? Perhaps, I mean, if you're in Chicago, for example. So you look at all three aspects, yourself, your environment, and your locale, or the objects around you and your situation. You expand your perception and direct it inwardly so that you know the relationship between them. That's the purpose of exercising these skills. By working with awareness and attention and mindfulness, you understand how your own mind reacts to problems. And in that way, you have a full, very well-rounded psychological muscle by which to train in the gymnasium of life. We have a question. What's the best way to silence chatter when trying to self-observe? That's the thing. Watch it. Listen to it. Observe it. But don't get caught up. This is the difficult, delicate thing about self-observation. We have to be able to pay attention to something without being absorbed by it. What often happens with us in the beginning is that if our mind is thinking, we tend to pay attention to it, but then we get sucked in. We get lost in a chain of associative thinking. The way that you help your mind to shut up is not by forcing it or not by hiding from it or not repressing it or just giving it what it wants. Just continue to watch it. Let it talk and talk and talk and don't feed it your energy look at it try to understand it and the better you get at this the mind will become quieter because it it has no outlet meanwhile it's you know it's in your mind but it's not controlling you and it's not clouding your perception or distracting you it's a nuanced skill it's the middle path of buddha neither running away from averting or justifying watch sustain your attention and it'll dissipate of its own accord in the same way that a glass of water with sediment and stone will become still when you just let it be if you just watch it it'll it'll uh, stratify into layers and you can cl clearly see what's going on in the in the water itself the same thing with the mind but that stillness only occurs without force but by gently bringing our attention back and just watching the fact. We have a question. What happens when the obsession with self-observation turns into a disassociation with others and reality? It has happened to me and to other practitioners I know that after some time of practicing self-observation, they could not get emotionally involved with almost anything. What happens is that they're doing it in the wrong way. In fact, like the example we gave of when can self-observation be too much or be wrong or mechanical? This is precisely it. Real self-observation is a skill of consciousness. We know that we're doing it right when we feel alert novelty and inspiration and joy, insight, understanding. Now, what happens with a lot of people is that because they obsess Fearing, you know, they fear that oh, if I'm not self-observing myself, I'm not going to discover my defects or understand my situation or overcome my ego. And they do it with a lot of paranoia. And this is this is harmful. And this is not correct. But it's very common. It happens to a lot of people where they feel like self-observation means disassociating from life, not feeling like things are real. It's like a dysphoric feeling. So... What happens is that people, in, in like in your case or in anyone's case like with this, is that the consciousness is not doing the work. It's the intellect. It's an ego. It's an error. If we're doing it right, it means that we have intuition and inspiration of how to act in diverse circumstances. And um, that gives us a kind of 
revitalization, a, a sense of uh, inv invigoration, like a jumping into cold water. You know, maybe shocking at first, but also it can be very pleasant. You know, it's like you you're alert, you're you're in an attentive state, you're seeing novelty in, in new things. But what happens with people who become disassociated often is that, you know, they tend to be using the intellectual center, thinking that they are observing themselves. And obviously, we know from our studies that the intellectual center is the slowest aspect of the human machine. It's a very cumbersome and almost inefficient machine. It's useful when we know how to use it consciously, but it can't do the work for us. And so what happens is that, you know, if you're disassociating from reality, it's like that's that's a breakdown of it could be a breakdown of the intellectual brain or it's also the emotional brain. And we don't want to do that. So my suggestion is if you find that you're in that state, step back from that and take a minute to re-engage your other brains. So if you find that it's intellectual, listen to some good music. Feel the superior emotions of that good music like listening to a symphony of Beethoven, something to distract, in a sense, self-distraction, you know? I know we talk about paying attention, but sometimes we need to use a different brain in the moment or to re-engage ourselves in a different way, sometimes a drastic way to get us to reconfigure ourselves. So that's what I suggest, because sometimes what'll happen is that the, the intellectual brain will break down and the emotional brain will start to break down. It'll start to corrode. Because it's being performed with tension and fear rather than serenity and relaxation. So it's a hard thing to master. I know it's challenging, especially, and you can learn. It just takes time. And if you find that you're really struggling with that, if you're disassociated, you know, take a minute to uh, perform activities that you enjoy, healthy activities like taking a walk or writing poetry listening to good music, engage some aspect of yourself that brings you inspiration so that you can engage yourself. Because self-observation is, is a profound activity, real deep engagement and love of experiencing the novelty of life, the freshness and aha moment of existence. So I hope that clarifies. That's some thank yous. We appreciate it. You're welcome. We have a question. What is the relationship between tests and ordeals and earthly world conditions? Is everything we see a reflection of the interior internal? Some philosophies state that really the external world is merely a reflection of our internal world. And more importantly, what we are psychologically tends to shape what happens outside of us. You know, if we're angry or upset, that tends to cloud our vision and make us fixate and obsess over things in accordance with the state of our condition, the anger that we're experiencing. In that sense, yes, their internal does reflect the external. More importantly, you will discover that reality or really how does your own mind influence your situation or how you perceive it by observing yourself. And by observing yourself is how you really reflect and understand not only the interior, or the internal, but the external and the relationship between the two. Only you can discover that reality for yourself through this technique. We have a question. How is self-remembering different from self-observation? Great question. Self-observation is like the skill of riding a bike. It's a technique. Self-remembering is the joy you feel when you ride. You have to know the skills of how to ride a bike, but self-remembering is when you are enraptured and enjoy in an enjoyment of the state of your inner divinity, your being. And this can come about, about through virtuous states like compassion, unsolicited kindness, a moment of joy in which you give to your neighbor or to some stranger serving the people around you. You are remembering the virtues, the qualities of your inner God, and that spontaneously manifests in you when you learn to ride. 
first you need the skills of how to observe, but to know how to enjoy and to be in the moment and to be a vehicle of your divinity. You know, we need really the the skills of observing, but we also need to recall what virtue is. And that can come about in many ways. And the way that we discover that is by entering the psychological gymnasium of life. So we'll have a whole lecture on this too, so what self-remembering is. What are the qualities of God in us? How do we become a vehicle of that? And how do we continue to be inspired by the insights of our own intuition so that they guide our heart and our way of being in the world? We have a question, kind of continuation of an earlier one. What remedy or recommendations could you give me for stages of skepticism and spiritual disconnection? Skepticism is healed by faith, not belief. My suggestion is that if your mind is very skeptical, meditate on what you really know. What have you verified in yourself? What do you know is real? And even if that may be minor or small, reflect on your foundation. And also reflect on the qualities of those initiates, those spiritual masters or teachers who embodied what we want to become. You look at the lifestyle of someone like Jesus or Buddha, Moses or Krishna, you see that their character was brilliant. And they resolved and entered situations with great delicacy and skill. And they manifested only the most ideal and profound, even in the worst situations. I think that sometimes we get skeptical, people get skeptical thinking about supernatural phenomena and wonderful experiences in the stars, but forget how to walk on their two feet. And that's why we study self-observation, to understand how to walk. Skepticism is healed by experiential reality, experiential truth, what we have verified. And I, you know, if I've in the past, I mean, I've been skeptical about certain things or have had doubts. I'd study some on viewers writings. I go back to the basics. I go look at what the scriptures have taught and corroborated the consensus between the two. And I meditate on what I've experienced in my own past works and Look at the psychological photography of who I was compared to who I am now. Because who I was in the past was not good. And I don't want to go back to that. So that is what has inspired me to continue forward. And spiritual disconnection, you know, I think it's good to find, again, activities that are going to heal you. Some people think that by being Gnostic that they have no joy in life. They become, they, they become very morbid. They feel disconnected. They don't feel like they belong in a community or around other people. And this is wrong. It's a, it's a ego. It's a, it's a defect. It's not the reality. And if we feel disconnected from divinity, we have to pray and, and aspire to deepen that connection for ourselves and to try. It may seem foreign or distant from us, but the reality is that it's distant from us because we tend not to look in the right places. So self-observation is what helps. And self-remembrance is, again, you know, reflecting on those virtues of your inner being, which come to us when we don't expect them or even crave them. They come when they're needed. So if you feel disconnected, especially spiritually, I recommend work on the mantra O or OM. Masi Padme Hume, which means really in the esoteric language, oh, my inner God, the blessings of my inner divinity. So prayer is good too. We have a question. Will sensing, feeling, or physical, or physical body be part of self-remembering? It's part of it. You know, you have to be aware that you're, you're in your body at all. 
You know, if you're not aware of yourself physically, you're not going to also be aware of your, uh, you know, your inner divinity too. Cause you know, we start here in this physical body, obviously for more advanced practitioners, um, as mentioned in some Sufi writings, I and mean, even the life of Samal and Vior, there were masters like him who were able to, you know, they could be talking to you physically, but, you know, at the same time, being the internal worlds and talking with the gods, you know, have that simultaneity of perception and multiple dimensions at once. And that's a skill of a great master, even a resurrected master. So we're not at that point. We'd start where we were at. We're at the bottom. So we begin here. Become aware of your body. Remember yourself in the body. And later you will elevate more and more. We have a question. One of the biggest obstacles I've faced is losing mindfulness of myself. It is most difficult when going throughout daily life as I have tasks and duties I have to attend to. My question is, how does one remain mindful while in the gymnasium of life? Some people in the beginning like to practice using a watch, maybe even a timer, you know, like a timer that goes off every hour. If you're more ambitious, you can do every 15 minutes, you know, remind you, hey, Pay attention, be awake. Somebody to remind you. I've known one person, one missionary would uh who used a computer a lot, would have a, a particular image on her wallpaper, her screen, reminding her, did you remember yourself? You know, it could be cute and fun like that, but you can time yourself or find things or find ways to remind yourself frequently throughout the day. That's one basic technique, you know a timer. But later on with skill, personally, I found that the best way for, in my case, to remember is to be in a very difficult job because while strenuous and difficult, it does force you to be awake, you know, to be mindful for dealing with particular or difficult clients, especially situations which can be very novel and, you know, require a lot of nuance and intuition to resolve. And that's obviously very intense, you know, it takes a lot of intensity to be engaged in that state in an effective way, in a compassionate way for the betterment of your community. A job can be like that. Some people don't have that, you know, (laughs) speaking of, if you call it a luxury to uh, have that, some people have a very lackadaisical job, you know, you're in front of a computer all day and it's easy to zone out. Or if you have a lot of tasks that you kind of get dispersed and stuck doing because they have to be done. That could be a challenge too. We can be very active in life physically, but also psychologically, spiritually be very asleep. We can be very diligent in our daily life, but also our consciousness can be very inert at the same time. So the, the, you know, the way to do it is um, plan some time in your day. It may not be perfect. You know, having some plan is better than none having some schedule, a basic foundation of like, you know, having times in your day where you check yourself, even if it means just for five minutes, if you can manage the time. Do you have five minutes at a, you know, have alarm set where I'm going to, you tell yourself, I'm going to sit here for five minutes, relax, and just focus on my breath and reground myself. That can be useful. But if we don't build in that time in our schedules, then, you know, unfortunately life will devour us. Salman VR mentions that we need to be able to consistently relax and to observe. Find time in your day. Make the time to remember how that's going to play out in your life. is going to be particular to you in accordance with your karma. So be patient. And if you have that structure in place, it will help. So we have another question. What's the best way to deal with the pain of the base of the spine? And would this be Kundalini buildup? Also, can you explain the path of Kundalini specifically mind to heart? Is the energy going to the crown and back down to the heart? So I know it's a bit off topic, you know, with uh, talking about the Kundalini. We'll mention briefly that, you know, 
people often associate awakenings of a spiritual type with their body. And the body is not a reliable indicator of spiritual progress because it's a different phenomenon, phenomenon in general. So I wouldn't rely on the physical body as a predicator of a spiritual awakening of that type. And if you want to study more about, you know, what is this particular energy of Kundalini, you know, how it rises to the mind from the base of the spine and then to the heart, you can study a book called The Perfect Matrimony by Samal and Vior. Or, you know, many of his books, he talks about this process, even in books like Igneous Rose, especially. But yes, that energy has to rise from the base of the spine to the mind and then go to the heart. Now, in the context of this lecture, if we're talking about self-observation, we can emphasize that having that energy present in the spine, working within the alchemist, can give a lot of energy for being awake, paying attention. That's why we emphasize save your energies, your creative forces, so that you can have a reservoir, um, a well of profound force by which to work. But it has to be managed intelligently. We have a question. Master Samuel states that Gnostic students self-observe themselves but do not feel themselves. Can you help clarify about this? It's going back to the me mechanicity of the practice. We can think we're, you know, seeing ourselves, maybe watching our thoughts, watching our environment, but we do not feel connected with our Divine Mother. And for those who are not familiar, the Divine Mother is an aspect of our inner divinity who is very close to us. To not feel oneself is not to feel that connection with that virtue. You know, it's easy to learn these skills of, you know, again, like riding the bike. But do you feel the joy of it? You know, self-observation is a tool that leads and helps with self-remembering. But self-remembering is precisely a distinct quality in which as we're using these skills of observing ourselves, we also feel that love in our heart for divinity in ourselves. To feel oneself in the heart is to be enriched and inspired by the qualities of our own inner being. And that can happen spontaneously, but it has to be cultivated here and now. Camp, not a mechanical process. So while we talk about certain skills of the consciousness, you know, remembrance is a very distinct, even superior emotional flavor in which we feel that quality of being a child of divinity. And that can't be defined with words, although it's been given many names. People do not feel the presence of their divine mother because we're not looking. We tend not to look. That is a quality of the heart, quality of the emotions, quality of the soul, which feels that connection with conscience and intuition, knowing how to act in life in the right way, in the right circumstances, before the right people, with wisdom. And to feel that is to be, you know, have that inspiration and joy and that longing to know more. Yeah, we'll build on this too, you know. Very deep topic. We'll talk about more in the upcoming lecture on remembering your true self. It's not intellectual faculty. It's the quality that a child feels when running to its mother when in pain. And to receive that warmth and embrace from our own God to heal us and to give us strength. We have a question. In chapter 11 of In Search of the Miraculous by Ospensky, he says that it is impossible for one person to wake up by themselves. Alone, we cannot awaken the consciousness. He says that one man can do nothing. Do you believe that we cannot uh, awaken without a group? Must we have a Sangha or be participating in a Gnostic group physically all the, of the time. Some of our, some of us are working alone, except for book studies and these lectures. 
groups can help, but there's no guarantee that they will be the most effective. Groups are only as effective as the individual practitioners are working on themselves. We can get a lot of joy and strength from our community, but it doesn't mean that by belonging to a group that you are going to be saved. In fact, there are many people who enter and leave the Gnostic movement who join groups or stick with a group for 20, 30, or 40 years, but who do not change. And someone Vero made a distinct commentary about this in some public lectures where he says that, you know, people who've been studying this for a long time but are not changing are wasting their time. And these are people who are part of, you know, distinct organizations, but are getting lazy. And that's the danger. But there's also great beauty and benefit we can get, great strength we get from our community. You know, if you're studying with our us online through book studies and listening to lectures, there are opportunities to visit and attend retreats where we can build deeper on these topics that also join together as a community, especially if you're studying online at a distance. A Sangha is a great and rare opportunity and is very useful. And we can great uh, acquire great strength and encouragement and growth from it. But it's important not to get stuck on the idea that we must have a group to succeed. There are many practitioners in Gnosis who are individual, working alone, and in silence, who are making great progress, even more than some people who are attending groups. What matters is our willpower. However, yeah, I mean, if you join a uh, school that establishes the three chamber system established by Salman Vior, that can be a great benefit and gave you a lot of force in your heart to continue. And so those opportunities do exist. And the way that you'll get there, if you need that help, and if you will get it, and will get it, is depending on your inner God, your inner being, who organizes the whole process. We have a question. In having a body condition in a very sensitive place that wants to dominate attention, it is confusing to me when to place attention on something in, in despite of the condition out of acknowledging and accepting the condition. This confusion um, prods many egos. Do you have any suggestions for division of attention within a sensitive condition? So sometimes we, we might suffer a, a very severe injury. Our body may be very sick. We may have a lot of pain. Pain can be a great obstacle, but also it can be a great incentive and a great impetus to change. So if you have a physical injury, obviously trauma to the body is hard to heal. And there are parts of the body that may be difficult to recuperate with modern medicine and, you know, the state of one's karma. And oftentimes that pain can be a distraction if it's intense. Oftentimes pain is exacerbated by identifying with it. If you find that you have a part of your body or condition that is making you very obsessed, what could be even more dangerous than the physical pain itself is the state of your mind. Now, obviously, having a trauma or injury is very painful. It's a very terrible thing to go through. And we always have a lot of compassion for that. But what will make that 10 million times worse is a state of mind that goes along with it. Is not to disassociate from oneself or one's body, but to develop the necessary willpower in one's situation to transform it. So if your body is constantly trying to pull your attention to the pain, you have to learn to look at that pain, but without identifying with it. And it may be that in some situations, if your pain is acting up, you also have to learn to distract yourself, not in a you know superficial way, but engage in activities that can help to redirect your attention if it's too much. 
But there have been cases of initiates who have suffered great traumas who were able to meditate even with dysentery. And if you're not familiar, for those all of you who are listening, I mean, that's a very crippling illness and very painful. But this person learned to meditate even despite the fact. So what, despite the terrible nature of a particular illness, one can transform it if the will is there if the intent is there and if the the consciousness is developed sufficiently so you can divide your attention by you know if your body is pulling you in you know observe your environment if your attention is trying to pull yourself to the pain observe what's going on around you direct redirect it try redirecting your attention see what that does and play with it see what happens that's one one skill or one technique you can try and uh, perhaps we can talk later about how effective that is for you. We have a question. I can observe an object by directing my attention to it, meaning that I am placing my attention in an object. But I also have to direct the attention to the subject, mind, the five centers, the ego, etc., Simultaneously, that will imply self-observation. My question is, will self-remembering be that I am aware that I am aware? Yes, it also means that you're aware that divinity is with you. It's a very different state. You're aware that you're watching, but also that you're aware of the, the source of awareness itself. And that's something that can't be quantified or labeled. Although certain schools have made great efforts to teach that. I mean, one valuable source of knowledge comes from the Sufis. Salman Vera mentioned that the beauty of Sufism is that it teaches about our interior state of life in God, the remembrance of God. If you want to know about different states of being, different qualities and virtues of the soul that are accessed when we remember divinity, study al Salah, principles of Sufism by Al-Kushari. We give a whole series of courses on that scripture itself. It's from Persia. And Salman Vera says the best of Sufism comes from Persia. So two courses, Sufi path of self-knowledge and Sufi principles of meditation teach all about that. We have a question. To be clear, there is no talking in the head and true self-observation, right? For example, if I am cooking and, so, and I self-observe, the internal voice says, I am chopping the onion now. The sauce smells good. I feel tired from work. This is an ego, right? Any talking in the head is an ego, right? It is the goal to get rid of that internal talking in the head. There are levels of stillness, levels of serenity, in which there is greater or less absence of thought. Self-observation in the beginning, obviously, shows us that our mind tends to be hyperactive. It talks a lot. It tends to predominate everything we do, labeling in the beginning all our experiences, like cooking, washing dishes, etc. With self-observation and self-remembering, we naturally learn to quiet the mind, not by force, not by will, like we're forcing the intellect to shut up, like we're strangling it. Instead, we're watching and letting it be. And as you naturally watch the mind and observe that fact, in the beginning, it's going to be talking. But the more that it exhausts itself, like a child going on and on in a conversation about nothing, you know, um, what happens is that the child becomes tired and goes to sleep. The same thing with the ego, if you're really diligent and watching. So self-observation doesn't mean that you're not going to think. In the beginning, especially, there's degrees of self-observation. There's degrees of serenity, of insight, of clarity. And as you're letting the water still within a cup filled with rock and dust, the dirt will go to the bottom eventually if you just let it be and just watch. And don't shake it. Let it be still. The same thing with the intellect. And eventually the mind will shut up. We'll stop talking. But... You have to let it be and you have to watch. K. 
can't force it. If you force it, your mind's going to be gagged and violent in the deeper levels of the subconsciousness, or it's going to be very um, agitated, even if in the surface it may seem fine. So yeah, it will become quiet eventually. We have a question. Is self-observation relative to other people? For example, I will be having a conversation with someone and see correlations between what goes on inside of me and the person I am talking to, almost as if I am sensing their psychology. There is that relationship. You know, uh, someone Vera mentions in Igneous Rose that the state of inspiration is when we're talking with a person and we sense their internal psychological being, their content what they're feeling and thinking. And we may feel a certain insight or inspiration, a intuition about what to say and do. We are deeply interconnected with people. We do not exist in a bubble. So self-observation, while it involves exploring our own psyche, it also has to involve understanding our external environment and the people we relate to. You may find that there are correlations between your own mind and what the person is doing or what they're saying because there is a connection. You know, we do influence people with our emotional states. We don't live in a bubble. We have this illusion that we can think and feel and do whatever we want in our mind and that there's no consequences. And this is a fundamental state of ignorance. There is a connection, you know, but I wouldn't get so fixated or obsessed that I can't think this thought or feel this because it's going to influence someone negatively. You know, that can lead to paranoia. It's not that, that's not the key of self-observation, really. You know, you want to, Notice what's there and don't force it, but watch. And you may find that you know intuitively the right thing to do and that the right virtuous state of action in your mind, in your heart, can guide you into how to appropriately help this person. And that you do sense, we do sense the psychological feelings and states of other people, even if physically we don't have any data, you know, even if their face or, you know, their expressions may not indicate that we can sense when someone is sad or angry or lustful. It's not a physical sense. It's psychological. So that does relate to self-observation. You're sensing not only yourself, but also your environment. We have a question. There are many forms of global folk music that I feel very, that feel very good to me. Although I love many kinds of classical music, I love all kinds of global folk, indigenous music, Celtic, Ukrainian, African, Nordic, North American, Appalachian, etc. Does this kind of music feed the body, personality, and ego? Or can it also feed the soul? There are many traditions in humanity that have conserved conscious values, but that tends to be very insufficient in most cases. You know, it is getting much more difficult now in our modern era to find traditions that still maintain the conscious principles of music. So if you're not familiar, for those who are listening to the nature of spiritual music, you know, there have been composers and works of art from the past, especially that conveyed through their art principles of divinity. The music reflects really the most heavenly states of being that we can imagine. It just if you listen to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and you you see clearly a reference to the highest heavens, the ninth. You know, if you look at the mystical Jewish tradition of Kabbalah, especially, we talk about this in our course called uh, Secret Teachings of Opera. My suggestion is rather than tell you what's good or bad to listen to, or tell you what to think, I would suggest that. You do listen to some of this music and examine your heart. There's a Sufi saying we mentioned in that course, we mentioned that, you know, art and conscious music is really for the life of the initiates and that it doesn't compel one to egotistical acts. So if you're listening to music and you're really self-observing yourself, you can see which music is inspiring your ego and maybe your lust or desire or anger. Depends. You have to watch your mind. This is not something that you can verify by accepting what someone else has said. You know, you have to really taste it, you know, investigate the difference between water and wine. You know, you have to watch your personality and watch your ego when you hear this music. What do you perceive? 
what is inspired in you? Is it good or bad? You know, and it's hard, you know, I, I know it's in the beginning, it's difficult to self-observe and distinguish the difference, but we have to learn how to be independent in this, like, you know, verify and like, listen, experiment, watch your emotional center. What comes up? What emotions, what feelings, what impulses, what desires, or is it something different? Is there something superior there? As a general rule of thumb, we reference that the classical music of the great initiates, like from the, especially the European tradition, uh, Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin, Liszt, though those were a very highly concentrated group of initiates who worked at a very, you know, over the course of a couple of centuries to provide humanity with divine teachings, but they're not the only ones. There are many throughout the world. I personally like listening to some indigenous musics like um, from some Sufis and even uh, Tibetan monks chanting. Some of those traditions are very deep and have res uh, reserved a lot of their knowledge from the past. The only way you can verify it is by meditating on the music and even investigating in the internal worlds. Okay, so I know we ran over. I thank you all for coming. I really appreciate the questions. Appreciate the turnout. And uh, we'll be uh, trying to schedule some more lectures soon online for people to attend. So I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening.